Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, I, I guess we can uh, start. It, uh, it is a pleasure to have uh, with us today Francis. Francis has basically made a number of significant contributions in optimization and machine learning. I think he's uh, one of the most well-known sort of researchers working in this area. Um, he works in, this, uh, in, in, in the lab in India and sort of has a big group now. Um, so uh, I'll let Francis tell you about his recent work on convex optimization and some model functions. Okay, so thank you, Bushmeet, for the introduction and for the, uh, for the invitation. So before I start, let me acknowledge the work of my uh, colleagues from uh, Berkeley, uh, Stephanie Zijelka and uh, Tübingen, uh, Suvrit uh, Sra. So today I'm going to talk about like some of the functions. Okay, so there will be some tutorial aspect to the talk. I will assume that most of you are, know what a similar function is, but don't really know, in fact. Okay, and for those people who are really like uh, uh, have in mind like practical applications, you can wait for the end of the talk where I'm going to talk about simple, efficient parallel graph cuts. Okay, so essentially, if you want to see a life beyond a sequence of graph cuts for computer vision, uh, please listen uh, to the talk. So before I start, some references okay, on some modularity. So please, if you're familiar with machine learning or computer vision, be careful with the, the very nice, there's a very nice book by Fujishige, but it comes from a very different perspective than we are used to. And so because of this, I wrote a tutorial paper, which is quite long now, which is available online, where everything I'm going to talk about in the first part of the talk uh, is there. And for the uh, part on efficient similar minimization, there will be uh, this next paper with uh, Souverit and Stephanie. Okay, so first, for the first uh, five slides, I try to convince you that you have similarity not everywhere, but almost everywhere. It pops up in places where you don't really uh, think it should. So the first one is in clustering or semi-supervised clustering. Let's say you have some, da some data like this, and you know some, punch, uh, some points are labeled as red, some points are labeled as black, and you want to, to cluster all the remaining points. Okay, this is an instance of semi-supervised clustering. And this is an example of a sum function minimization problem. Uh, going a bit further, uh, graph cuts, okay, this is maybe the most widely used uh, instance of sum modular minimization, is also cast as a uh, sum modular function minimization. So by no means uh, all problems using sum modular functions are cast as minim minimization problems. You have a lot of problems based on maximization. Okay, so this is an example from a, a sensor placement, okay, you have a bench, you have a street which you want to cover with as few sensors as possible, and every sensor has an area of coverage, and you want to uh, minimize the number of sensors, and this can be cast as a, a sum modular function maximization problem. So again, sum modularity pops up, pops up in a very natural way. Also, for people that care about like uh, probabilistic modeling, experimental design, when you want to select points which you want to, uh, to sample, uh, and in the, in, the, in the usual like uh, maximum likelihood framework is also a problem in some modular function maximization. Okay, so two types of problem, minimization, maximization, which can be cast using some modularity, but some modularity goes beyond uh, simply like discrete optimization problem. One of them is isotonic regression. Okay, it's a very classical problem in statistics. You have a bunch of points uh, xi, one to p, and you want to uh, estimate an increasing function uh, of i, okay, which will uh, uh, fit closely the, the, the x size. So you want to find y i, so that the least square loss is small, but y i is increasing. Okay? So this is not a discrete optimization problem, but it may be solved using uh, tools from some modularity. Similarly, uh, strata sparsity, so I won't give a talk about strata sparsity uh, today, but uh, in many situations, you want to estimate uh, vectors, so latent variables, or here latent uh, coefficients in a topic model, and you want the, the, the topics to organize in some nice uh, structure, like a tree. Okay, so this is something which, took a lot, which looks a lot like a work by Dave Bly and, uh, and, uh, and colleagues, where you want to find topics which organize into a tree. Okay? 
And again here, some modularity pops up and can be used uh, for that. So I won't talk about it today, but it's clearly something which is possible uh, with some modularity. This I will skip. Uh, so image denoising, okay, again, a uh, problem where if you use the total variation as a, as a prior for your problem, it is also an instance of a problem based on some modularity, and I will come back to that later uh, in the talk. Then finally, even like in other places, like uh, in computer science, maximum wave spanning trees, matroids, are a place where uh, uh, similarity plays a role. And if you want to know more, you can look at the tutorial paper. But there's a nice connection between the matroids and similar functions. And in fact, historically, similar functions were created as generalization of uh, matroids. So I won't talk anymore about it. It's just uh, introductory material. So just to set up notations, I'm going to consider a set V uh, with a P, uh, P, uh, P, uh, P elements. I will call 2 to the V the power set uh, of cardinality 2 to, to the P. And I will consider a lot of problems which will be minimizing a set function F. So a set function takes as input a set, so an element of the power set, and goes to a set of real numbers. And I'm going to try to minimize or maximize functions. So a classical reformulation is the one uh, 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 through like pseudo Boolean functions. So it's a fancy way to say that you map uh, subsets to vertices of the hypercube. Okay, we'll do this constantly uh, in this talk. Is that give me any subset of V, I can map it to the vertex of the hypercube here, p equals three. Okay, and I go from a subset to a vertices by taking indicator functions, and vice versa. You can go from a vertices uh, to uh, to the subset. Okay, so depending. On your community, you will consider formulations where W is in the among the vertices of, vertices of the hypercube or the subset. Just a notation. Okay, so just a last slide in terms of uh, advertisement for other things which I won't talk about in this talk. So typically in machine learning, people do a lot of supervised, when you do supervised learning, you have a risk minimization. Typically, you optimize over a convex, uh, convex set, typically a vector space. And in many, in many situations, you want that vector to satisfy some constraints related to chains, graph, or any combinatorial structure. This was the case for, the, for trees, for example. When you want to decompose a new document in this like, hierarchy of topics, you want to start first from the root of the tree and then select the following path in the tree. And this can be done using essentially some of the functions. But look at the paper if you want to know more, and I will stop talking about it. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk. With first, the first part of the, of the talk reviews some of our functions, and in particular, their relationship, relationship with convexity. So essentially, they behave like convex functions in some, some sense. And essentially, at the end, we define three different types of problems, which are all somewhat equivalent to each other, but have different properties. And then I will go over this uh, new work with uh, Stephanie and uh, Souvrit. Okay, so definition of some modularity. So if you take any set function, it is sum modular. If only if you, if you take any two subsets, f of a plus f of b is greater than f, f of f intersect b and f of a union b. So if you have an additive, additive measure, this is equality. And for sum modularity, you just need a one sense, one direction in the inequality. So another equivalent definition is the one with diminishing returns. So sometimes it is, it is a bit more intuitive. So essentially, the cost of adding k to your set, okay, is uh, decreasing when A is increasing. Okay, you have this notion of diminishing return, where, uh, so Stephanie has this nice uh, picture, which I didn't dare to put on my slides, like at Burger King or McDonald's, uh, the cost of an, of, of, of an additional fry is less if you already had one fry uh, than if you had no fries, okay? So diminishing cost, so McDonald's is a sum modular in a sense, okay. Okay, so this is a little definition. So let's look at some examples just to set, uh, to be clear. So the most natural uh, submodular function is in fact a modular function. So throughout this talk, I uh, will use a lot of this notation, S of A. So if S is a vector, okay, you can define a set function by simply uh, summing the elements uh, that belongs to A. Okay, so S of A, when S is a vector, is a function, okay, and this is this can be seen as being S transpose the indicator vector of A. Okay, but this is common in the submodular analysis to use that notation. And this is a modular function. Okay, it's both uh, submodular and it's, in, it's uh, inverse is uh, it's negative is uh, it's opposite is submodular. But any concave function of such a function is also submodular. Okay, you have this notion of diminishing returns, 
where a function of cardinality will be submodular only when that function is concave. Okay, this is really a first example of submodularity, but it goes beyond this, of course. You have covers, okay? So let's say, going back to my sensor placement example, if, if, if uh, you, uh, now, you have to be a bit careful. So uh, here, the base set is an index over all possible sensors, okay? Here I have uh, eight, eight sensors, so P equals eight, and every sensor has an area in, a, in, a, in the plane. And if I take the union of all uh, sensors indexed by elements of A, okay, so this is uh, this object, and I take its area, uh, then uh, it is submodular. Okay, so this one instance of submodularity is a set cover. I think maybe the most important example is, is the following cuts. So if you take any graph, okay, directed or undirected, if you take the cut in a graph, okay, the, the number of edges which are crossed between A and uh, the uh, complement of A, then this is submodular and this is very, very classical. Okay. Other examples before moving on, uh, entropies. Okay, so this is maybe the only one of the few uh, submodular functions which, which cannot be cast as a graph cut. Okay, this is uh, entropy. Okay, so if you have, if you have uh, say, a P random variables and you have the joint distribution, if you consider like variables indexed by A and take the joint entropy of those variables, then you get a submodular function, okay? And if you have a Gaussian distribution, okay, uh, this works as well, but now the entropy of the Gaussian is just a log debt. So essentially, the log debt of a sub matrix is also a submodular function, and this has been used extensively for experimental design, okay? So I won't talk about it today, but clearly entropies are one example where you cannot really uh, see this as a graph cut. Okay, let's, let's, not, let's uh, now define some new quantities which you may not be familiar with. The first one is a Choke integral, or often referred to as a Lovas extension. So first, I'm going to uh, identify subsets with the vertices of uh, the hypercube. And what I'm going to do, now my set function defines a function at all vertices. Now what I need is to be, what I want is to be able to define a function everywhere within the hypercube, okay? and then uh, in all, uh, for all, uh, all elements of the vector space. So what I'm going to do, the easy way to see this, is I'm going to cut uh, the hypercube in simplices where the ordering of the components are, are constant, okay? So you have uh, here, you have six of those vertices and for, for those simplices, and on each of them, I will do linear interpolation, okay? So if you do this, you end up with a formula uh, like this, where you first order, take any W, order its components, and then do this is a uh, linear interpolation between uh, the, the various vertices. Okay, it's not trivial that this is a linear interpolation, it's just a, just a fact that you can define uh, a set function everywhere by just linearly interpolating between, uh, between summits, between the uh, vertices. Okay, so this is called the Choke uh, integral, and it has some property which is uh, always uh, true, even, even in F, it's not so modular. Of course, it is piecewise linear just by, uh, by construction. It is positively homogeneous also. And of course, it is indeed an extension in the sense that if you go back here and take a vertex, any vertex, then the value of the extension at that vertex is a value of the set function on the corresponding subset. Okay, so we do have an extension. So the most classical example is take cuts. I come back to your question in one minute. If you take a cut, the Lovas extension is a total variation. Okay, so it is very classical. Andrew? It seems to be defined only in the first orthant. So it is defined only in the first orthons, uh, at least through this uh, definition. But if you take that one, you can, uh, any W uh, will, be, uh, will be okay. You order them independently of the sign of the components. But the definition and the way it is mostly used is always used for a W which will be within the hypercube. And in fact, for most, uh, half of the talk, W will be in the positive orthons, but it's not limited to that. Uh, if w, f of any w, I first sort the elements and then apply this function, or I don't yep. have to sort the elements? You first, you take w, yeah. sort the elements, and apply this formula. So the key result from uh, Lovas is the following, is the fact that your function is submodular if and if its extension is convex. Okay, so this is a very key result in a submodularity, which shows that the, uh, the links between submodularity and convexity. So I could end up here, and typically most people end up there, okay, saying that's enough, and this shows that you can minimize similar functions in polynomial time, but I need to go a bit further. 
So I need to look a bit deeper into the structure of this uh, subnetter function, uh, of this uh, extension f. So I need to introduce poly a new uh, polyhedra, okay, which may look very abstract at first, but are clearly important for uh, what I want to do. And those uh, polyhedra were introduced by Edmonds in the 70s. Okay, so let's look at, at that definition. So there, those are two polyhedra, uh, two polyhedra in uh, RP, okay, and they are defined through half hyperplanes. Okay? So, in, uh, uh, so for every uh, subset, you have a hyperplane, which is simply S of A less than F of A. So the sum of the components of S indexed by A has to be less than F of A. So essentially, all the half hyperplanes have normals, which are only vectors with zeros and ones. Okay? So in 2D, so this is for P of F. In 2D, this is S2 less than F of 2, and S1 less than F of 1. And this hyperplane is S1 plus S2 less than F of 1, 2. Okay? So you get this for the so-called submodular polyhedron. And if you restrict uh, that polyhedron to be uh, so that the, this inequality is an equality, then you get what people call the base polyhedron, it's a polytop, which is over there. Okay? So essentially, uh, this is in 2D. And in 3D, you have something like this. Okay? So why do we need to introduce those, uh, those objects? Because the Lovas extension is convex, fine. It's convex and homogeneous. Okay? So as all convex homogeneous functions, it is represented as a maximum of linear functions. Okay? If you take a norm, a norm is uh, homogeneous, and it's a maximum of linear functions, where the slows belong to the unit ball of the dual norm. This is true for all possible all possible uh, convex homogeneous function. And that set for the Lovas extension is exactly B of F. Okay, so first, so those are polytops, uh, polyhedra, many facets, many extreme points, okay, up to uh, 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 factorial P. And the fundamental property from Edmonds is that if, if you have a subnetar function, okay, then you know how to maximize linear functions on, those poly on that polytop, take B of F. So you have a big polytop, with many vertices, many extreme points. You can't even decide if you're in it or not, but what you can do is a maximize a linear function. And how can you maximize linear function? Then you take a slope, W. So here I will assume the slope is a positive number for simplicity, but this applies to any W. You order its components, okay? And you uh, simply have a closed form expression for the value of the uh, maximal element S. And then what you obtain is that the maximal the maximum of all elements of that polyhedra of double transpose S is your Lovas extension. Okay? So for all convex positively homogeneous function F, there exists a set like this. It turns out that for this particular uh, subcase, this set is the base polyhedron defined uh, like this. Okay? So the, the, the formulas behind the, poly, the polytops, the polyhedra, are not important. The important aspect is that my, my Lovas extension is a maximum of linear functions, and I can compute that maxima uh, efficiently. Okay, this is really all, most all papers dealing with submodular functions and minimization will end up uh, doing something of the form. Okay, so it's really, uh, at the end, um, this, is, this is what I'm going to use, represent uh, f of w as a maximum of linear functions. So now we are uh, ready to go back to, uh, uh, to the two main results to summarize. The first one is by Lovas as well, is that the fact that you can solve some of the function minimization as a convex problem. Okay? So in this statement, the first one is trivial. Why is it trivial? Because here you minimize the set function, okay? and here I minimize the Lovas extension on the vertices of the hypercube. By definition of the, uh, of the fact that f is an extension of, uh, so small f is an extension of capital F, this is a trivial statement. So the non-trivial statement is the fact that you can replace the vertices okay, by the full hypercube. Okay? So at the end, you can solve a subnetar function minimization through a convex problem. Okay? So this is the reason why, uh, one of the reasons why you can minimize subnetar functions in a polynomial time. Okay? It's a convex problem. And uh, the key element that we will use a lot through the rest of the talk is the fact that uh, f of w is not any function. Okay? So if I give you a convex problem, which is, oh, I want to minimize over a simple set like this, a function which is convex, I have many possible uh, algorithms, and I will present subgradient descent in the next slide. But what is really particular 
in my problem is that f is uh, homogeneous and is represented as a maximum of linear functions. That said, b of f is extremely complicated, okay, uh, even for simple uh, functions like cuts, but I know how, give me a w, I can find s uh, easily, as this is uh, done by simply sorting the elements of w and computing at most uh, p values of the submodular function. Okay, so this was uh, the main link. So let's try to see uh, if this is helpful for submodular function minimization, okay? So first, let's look at the dual problem, okay? So the one key aspect of submodular minimization, and again, this is not always used a lot in computer vision, is the fact that uh, you have a dual problem, okay? For so its min cut max flow for min cut, but it's more general, is that if you start from, so the submodular minimization problem, okay? So the min over A, by the theorem just uh, uh, mentioned above, it is equivalent to a convex problem. So you minimize the, uh, the low extension restricted to the hypercube. You represent f as a maximum of linear functions. Okay? So now you have a min-max problem. And by convex strong duality, you can invert the max and the min. Okay? And get, uh, this we'll do several times during that talk. So you invert the max uh, and the min. And now you can minimize in closed form because minimizing uh, linear function over zero one, you just take the mean of the element and zero, and you get a maximum over your base polytope B of F of a concave function of S. Okay, so essentially, uh, you have a convex duality, and this we're going to uh, use it uh, a lot in this talk. Okay, so at the end, simply like uh, uh, convex duality. So because of these results, there was a lot of work uh, in the 80s and 90s and 2000s to show that uh, you can really uh, optimize such submodular functions using tools which were similar to graph cuts. Okay, so the classical algorithms of graph cuts, and I'm really not an expert in those, like push reliable scaling techniques, were used for submodular functions by people like uh, Shriver, Iwata, and Orlin. And I've come up with uh, algorithms which are similar to the cut algorithms, okay, that will output a set A and also uh, S as a certificate. So a key element, in uh, minimization, since it is a convex problem, you can always output certificates, and here certificates are obtained by exhibiting an element of the best polytope. So it, it does have polynomial complexity, but the best uh, complexity so far are p to the six, okay? So if you take p being one million, if you do a graph cut with one million pixels, it's going to take a while, and even worse, uh, those are typically not never implemented, okay? So essentially the impact of some modularity on practical problems has been, has been limited, okay? And what, I would, what I would try to show is that by seeing this as a convex problem, you can go a bit further, but the first approach will not either be very practical. So the first approach will be, oh, to realize that I have a convex problem, okay? I don't need to go uh, up to machine precision to solve my problem, okay? And using classical uh, arguments for machine learning, like our cost functions are averages, so why bother going uh, below 10 to the minus three in terms of, of uh, precision? And this you can, you, can, you, can, you can do. And now you can see this as a pure convex problem, minimizing a convex function uh, on a convex set, okay? And using some nice properties of your convex function, the fact that it is polyhedral, okay? It's piecewise, uh, piecewise linear, and the fact that you, are, you can represent it as the maximum of linear functions, okay? As I will show you that, it won't work really. Why? Because, and this was a debate with Andrew yesterday, in many cases you need to get a precise optimum. Okay, and I will show slides later showing that this statement, which is true for uh, like supervised machine learning, might not be so true for some of the large minimization problems, or at least the ones that people uh, solved in a computer vision. So the first approach which you can use is subgradient descent. Okay, so you open any book in the first order methods for optimization. This is the first one that pops up for a non smooth problem. So essentially, at every time step, it's an iterative algorithm that goes from t minus one to t uh, by going down the direction of a subgradient, which is essentially uh, something that would be uh, defined a tangent at, uh, of f at w. And this is obtained through my nice uh, greedy algorithm where I just sort the elements of w and compute some values of the function. I get this nice convergence rate uh, from uh, any standard book, like here I've put nester off. It's one over root t. Okay, so one over root t is very small. Okay, if you want to achieve 10 to the minus uh, six, you need like one million iterations, okay? So this, again, has not led to any practical algorithms for some of the large function minimization. So you can run them, 
And as I will show like in a few slides, I think next one, the typical benchmark that we use typically have 1,000 variables. Okay, I'm sure it will make, make the people have vision a bit uh, uh, skeptical because many problems, you have many more than 1 million. So what I want to talk about today is another approach which is competitive, is using like analytic center cutting planes. So if you want to know more, you can look at the, uh, at the tutorial paper. So before looking at, at curves, let's try to define a new problem. Okay, so this is maybe the novel aspect of the, of the talk for, for many of you. I'm not going to minimize uh, the uh, low bias extension, but I will try to minimize it uh, plus some what I call a separable function. Okay, and quickly, this will be a quadratic function. So I'm not only uh, I care about minimizing f, I want to add another function. So why do you want to do this? The first one is because some problems are directly cast uh, like this. Okay, so if you take uh, total variation denoising, okay, take this one. This is my seminalar function. This is my, uh, this is my uh, total variation. So solving the problem, the taking a least square fit plus total variation is exactly a problem of that form where you have a separable function. The least square uh, is separable, least square is separable, plus some total variation. Okay, so some problems are directly cast as being a separable function plus uh, the low vast extension. Similarly, isotonic regression is, is of a similar form. Okay, so if you take a cut in a directed chain, then your y's will satisfy that constraint if only if the value of the low vast extension is zero for that, for that, for that, uh, for that uh, y. So essentially, if you take the least square loss and add lambda times your, your low vast extension for lambda sufficient, sufficiently large, you get a formulation for isotonic regression. Okay, so those are problems which are directly cast as, uh, as such. You also have like uh, other like all potential like uh, stratospacity problem by using proximal methods, which I won't talk about. Here we focus mostly on these relationships with some of the function minimization. And for this, I will consider the simplest of all like uh, separable function, which is the sum of uh, quadratic functions. Okay, so now the goal is to relate the, minimal, uh, the minimum of this plus the low vast extension to uh, the sum of the large function minimization. So the key, first, a bit of convex duality before doing this. Before doing this. So this is my, my problem which I, uh, uh, that I want to solve, minimizing f of w plus uh, the square, uh, the square, uh, a square fit. I'm presenting f of w as a maximum of linear functions. Okay, I have a mean max. I inverse, invert max and mean. Now I can solve in W in closed form. So W will be uh, Z minus S. And I get the dual problem, which is uh, that maxima of a constant minus, okay, uh, the distance between S and Z. So essentially, that problem is equivalent to projecting Z onto B of F, okay, an orthogonal projection of uh, Z onto B of F. Okay, I recall just the definition of, of, B of, of B of F is defined through hyperplanes uh, like this. Okay, so essentially, if you want to solve that, then you get uh, a problem which is now uh, smooth on the base polytope. You want to mi minimize or maximize a quadratic function. Okay, so it's the exact same duality as before, but replacing the constraint to be in the hypercube by this penalty, and this uh, change uh, the final dual problem. So what is the key, uh, key result? This is maybe the most important slide, so I'll go, I'll go slowly is to relate, uh, so I will relate the unique minimizer of that problem. So it is unique because I have a strongly convex problem, okay? So this is strongly convex, so W is unique. I will call it W star. And I will consider also problems defined uh, like some of the minimization problem, okay? Where I want to minimize F, F of A, minus a modular function, okay? So just a sum over uh, all elements in A of the corresponding components of Z plus a constant times the cardinality. Okay, so for, for every alpha, I have a new problem. Okay, and we call A of alpha any minimizer of that problem. So it's any because it, this may have several, uh, several uh, minimizers. So the key property uh, outlined by Chambol and Darbon is the fact that if I know how to solve a single convex problem, okay, of that form, so here, in the con when F is a graph cut, okay, this is a total variation denoising, so if you can solve the total variation denoising, okay, a single convex problem, then I know the solutions of all of those problems, okay? All of these I can minimize by simply taking the level set, the level sets of W, okay? So this is 
so what uh, well known for uh, for uh, total variation and this is true for all uh, summonella functions okay so essentially solving this is uh, equivalent to solving all of those okay and equivalent because you can go uh, back and forth so here the simplest way is to start from w star and to find uh, alpha by taking level sets but if you know all solutions alpha okay by just recording uh, when the set a of alpha are moving when alpha is increasing you can record the values of uh, w, uh, w star. Okay, so the most the easy way is to see into that direction. If you solve that guy, you solve that guy. Okay? So here, so the key uh, thing is this can be used in two ways. Okay? So the two problems are equivalent. This separable quadratic problem is equivalent to a sequence of subnular function minimization. So this has been used in two ways. First, trying to solve this using, using this. Okay? And um, yeah, so you solve this convex problem. You solve this convex problem so that you can solve the uh, subnular minimization problem. This is, this is what I'm going to do in the, last, the, let, the, the, late, the latest part of the talk. Okay, I'm going to solve that problem, which will be simpler to solve that problem. And how, how do I do it? I, get, I take the solution W and I just threshold at zero and obtain the solution of that guy. Okay, so this was first outlined by Fujishige in 2005, and this I'm going to use heavily uh, later in the talk. And just as a reference, you can do the opposite. Okay, so if your goal is not to solve uh, this uh, subnular function minimization, but the goal is to solve the total variation denoising, okay, and you know how to solve those problems efficiently. For example, if you know how to do graph cuts, okay, you can solve total variation denoising by a sequence of graph cuts. Okay, a graph cuts. This is not new, and there's a very, very general strategy by Gronvelt, divide and conquer. Okay, so by a sequence of at, at most uh, P. Uh, P uh, graph curves, you can solve total variation. So what uh, we have done with Stephanie and Suvretra is to uh, go from O of P to O of log P. For the experts in parametric max flow, you have a similar behavior that you can go from at most P graph curves to at most log P, and this applies as well for subnular function minimization. Okay, so this, I won't talk about it today, but this provides a way to solve like uh, isotonic regression, for example, in a very, uh, very efficient way. Okay, so here are those slides. I'm just comparing several algorithms. The details are not important. What I want you to look at is that number. Okay, so the typical benchmark that people use in semi-modularity are P equals 500. Okay, because otherwise it's too slow. Okay, and um, so I won't describe the details. The goal now will be to try to have an impact. Okay, so it, to me it is fair to say that all like applications of semi-modularity, like semi-modularity has not been very helpful for computer vision. Because at the end of the day, people still do a sequence of graph cuts. Okay, so let's try to uh, to go beyond beyond that. Okay, so this will be the, the last the last uh, 25 minutes, uh, uh, 15 minutes of the talk. Okay, so just as a summary of what I've said so far. Okay, I'm going to minimize the subnular function. So the thing graph cuts, if you want. So I have three problems. Okay, I have the uh, combinatorial problem. Okay, so I want to minimize my subnular function or minimize the lowest extension on the vertices of the hypercube problem, uh, the discrete problem. You have the continuous problem, which is relaxing uh, the constraint to be either 0 and 1 by being on the, in the interval 0, 1. Okay, it's continuous convex. And I have my new problem, which is I replace that constraint by a square penalizer, okay, f of w plus a, a half of the uh, square norm. Okay, so what I've shown uh, uh, so far is that so D and C are equivalent, and S, if you can solve S, then you have the solution, you have the minimizers of all of those functions, okay, for all possible lambda. So in a sense, this problem, if you get a solution, gets you much more information than uh, the problem here, okay. We're only going to threshold at zero, because we care only for lambda equals zero. So really, the, the take-home message is that S gives you much more information, but it happens to be also easier to solve. Okay, so you might think like in a classical learning scenario, if you solve a more complex problem, you're going to uh, perform, it's going to be harder. This is a case where this is not true. The, hard, the, simple, the harder problem, which gives you more information, uh, is easier to solve. Okay, so let's look how you can do it. So the main assumption, and uh, it's uh, the one of decomposability. Okay, if you take any, uh, many uh, set, functions, set functions that people use in practice, so it may be decomposed as a sum of simple functions. 
Okay, so here, how do I define simple functions? I will define them through the fact that you can minimize them efficiently, and in particular, minimize them plus any modular function. Okay, so, uh, so this is really the constraint, but this is what I call by simple. If, let's say you care about the 2D grid. Okay, I don't know why you would care so much about it, but let's say you care about the 2D grid. One example is the union of all edges. It's true, if you have uh, P edges or P square edges, well, here it's four P edges, then uh, uh, two P edges, you can, uh, if you do this, then it's true it's decomposable, but it's not efficient. Why? Because if you consider uh, independently edges, if you do like local uh, optimization of your edges, you need a lot of time to communicate a change in one part of the graph to the rest of the graph. Okay, so this is typically not good. And the typical uh, situation which should be considered is taking a grid like this, a 2D grid, and see it as a union of the one dimensional chains, the horizontal, horizontal one and vertical ones. Okay, so for those ones, uh, you can, it's easy to minimize uh, the sum of function. It's just message passing, okay, on the, on the chain, so it's easy. Okay, and we're going to use that fact. So of course, we are not the first one to consider uh, that, that decomposition, okay, and I'm sure I've missed some people, but the earlier reference I know of is Komodakis, uh, Paragios, and, uh, and others. So at the end, they use the exact, exact same thing, okay, decomposing the sum of the function, but they do what? They do it on the, what I call the continuous problem, okay, and it is on, on, uh, yeah, we, we see later the difference, okay? They don't use the, uh, the squared regularizer, they use the constraint on zero one, and we see it's uh, quite different. Okay, so let's look at, uh, the, context problem, at the context dual, this is the, the third time today. Okay, so now we take uh, two functions, okay? With two, it's much, much easier to, uh, to, uh, to present, let's take only two. So I replace f by f1 plus f2. So now I can introduce the dual variables S1 and S2, okay? F1 is a maximum of S1 transpose W. F2 is a maximum of S2 transpose W. So now I have a max in S1, S2, a min in W. Okay, I can still invert min and max. And if I do this, W is obtained at minus S1, minus S2, and I get a dual problem uh, like this. Okay, so the dual problem has a very nice structure now. Why? Because it's a maximum over S1 in a certain polytope, S2 in a certain polytope of the distance between S1 and minus S2. So in a sense, my goal is to find the closest points between two polytopes, those polytopes being B of F1 and minus B of F2. Okay, so you can see the reformulation allows you to uh, obtain a, a, a nice formulation in terms of distance between two polytopes. And as we will see, there are many algorithms to do, to do this. So let's compare uh, with uh, the other problem, okay? So the key here, the only novelty, okay, is realizing that you can uh, use that problem instead of that one, okay? And you get a, a better behaved dual for which classical approaches may, may be used uh, and you change uh, with better convergence rates, okay? So this is my problem from before. So I get a smooth dual, okay? But if I use uh, the one from, uh, this is uh, the problem from uh, if you take, if you keep the constraint to be in 0, 1, P, okay, you can have the exact same trick, find the dual problem, but now what you have, you have a dual function which is non-smooth, okay? It's piecewise, uh, it's piecewise uh, fine, but it is uh, non-smooth, okay? So all the, all those uh, other works dealing with those uh, need to, uh, since you have a non-smooth problem, then you have to use subgradient or some, some form of smoothing and acceleration but at the end, quite a number of hyperparameters, okay? And at the end, the number of iterations is quite large, okay? So what I'm going to do for the last uh, 10 minutes is to look at approaches to, do, uh, to solve this. Okay, first, let's look at some classical algorithms, okay, to solve that problem of finding the closest points between two polytops. So the first, this is a problem which I have. So the dumbest one is gradient descent, okay? So projected gradient descent. Why? I have a problem which is differentiable. I know how to project, and this is a key, the key aspect here. As we can see, uh, projections onto uh, a single B of, of F1 is equivalent to minimizing a total variation with that F1 alone, okay? And this needs to be solved efficiently. In our context of graph cuts, okay, with 1D total variation, with 1D uh, chains, for those projections on B, B of F1 or B of F2 to be, uh, for them to be efficient, you need an efficient way of doing 1D total variation, okay? 
So here in the paper, we have used the code from, uh, from uh, Souvrit and his, in, in his student. But we also have in the paper with uh, Stephanie and Souvrit a general uh, uh, technique, essentially with O of log P. With log P, like a message passing, uh, you can uh, get the 1D total variation. Okay? So essentially, the key aspect is going to work whenever uh, you can project onto F1 efficiently. Okay? It's better if you have a dedicated algorithm to do this, but if you only know how to minimize the sub function F1, you, we, can, we can do it. Okay? So we know how to project on, a B, uh, of B of, on B of F1. We know how to project on B of F2, so we can do a projected gradient descent with step size one half because this, this uh, function is, um, is uh, Hessian is bounded from above by uh, two, okay? And this is a very simple formula. You can also do like alternate projections, and this is clearly what, uh, this is the most, uh, the easiest, easiest way. So to find the distance between two polytop, you can simply project on one, then project, project, project on the other, and, uh, and so on, okay? So this is what I'm going to uh, show here. So on the left, so this is my movie, okay? But, uh, so on the left, this is, uh, Two polytops, okay, this be uh, B of F1 minus B of F2, and I want to project, so I'm going to do alternate projections. So don't look on the right, okay? If you do this, then so you get like this, then you, you, you progress like this, and up, and ultimately you get the global optimum on the left, okay? So after a finite number of iterations, you can show that if the, yeah, you can get the global optimum, but you need quite a few steps, okay? So the key uh, novelty of uh, our work is to use a different method to do uh, finding the distance between two polytops. I have to go back up. up, up. And the, the key thing, okay, is to uh, go beyond alternate projections. So just to summarize what I have just uh, described, I have two polytops, okay, A and B. I will call P A and P B the orthogonal projections onto those uh, polytops. And essentially, alternate projections will iterate P A and then P B, okay, and going over and over. So this is very, very well studied in, a, in a applied mathematics, and people know exactly how it converges and when it converges. Essentially, if your two polytops or your two convex sets intersect, it does converge, uh, to, um, it does converge to a point which is in, t in the intersection, okay? And if not, it does converge to uh, the closest point, okay? So it's, way, it's well known. And what we're going to use is a recent, a recent, Okay, recent work from uh, Bauschke, Combet, and uh, et al., which will not iterate projections, but reflections, okay? So to be perfectly honest, my intuition behind those uh, ref reflection methods is, uh, is limited. Uh, so here, R of A is a reflection. Why? Because if you, if you project and then go further, it's, it's actually the reflection, uh, the reflection. So if you project into a plane and you do twice the step, then you do get the reflection with respect to the plane, so this is also, uh, you can define for any uh, convex set, R of A, and you iterate that uh, weird uh, sequence of reflection and uh, averaging. And the funny aspect is that if the two uh, convex sets intersect, okay, so you do converge to, the, to a point which is, uh, which is uh, in the intersection, but in my situation, I want the convex, set, the convex sets won't intersect, and you can show that it diverges. So the sequence of steps is diverging, but you can extract a subsequence which does converge. Okay, so it's a bit mysterious, but uh, this is what's happening. And for the experts, essentially, this is Douglas Rashford in a certain, uh, certain, uh, certain uh, formulation, uh, ADMM. Okay. So let's look at how it works on, on the right. Okay, you start from this. In uh, purple, this will be the diverging sequence, and in black and uh, green, this is a converging sequence. Okay, so you go on and you, you get quickly to the global optimum and then you diverge, but your uh, subsequence does not move, okay? So this is just an illustration showing that uh, in practice and also in theory for, at, for very simple polytops, it does uh, converge better than alternate projections. Moreover, it has no parameters. It's a key, it's a key, it's a key, okay? So here, up, 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 up. There is no convergence rate, okay? So for the moment, uh, so my goal is to go, go back and see. So Combet with the co-author is in Paris. My goal is to catch him to uh, make sure he finds the convergence rate for that method. Okay, pop, pop, pop. okay so let's look at, at numbers a bit, okay? So I have uh, four minutes left. So here I'm taking uh, like a 500 by 500 image, okay? And I will compare different approaches. For all of, the, all of them, this is iteration number on the, the x-axis and uh, logarithm of the duality gap, 
Okay, so here we, we force the methods to certify the solution. Okay? And uh, so here, iteration number is what? Is number of times you're going to uh, access B of F1 and B of F2. Because number of times you have to do message passing on all lines, on all lines, and uh, all horizontal lines, and all vertical lines. Okay, so this is the same from all algorithms. Those are all the old approaches, which are all based on solving the continuous problem. Okay, so you simply relax the integrality constraint, and uh, at the end, you have several versions of, uh, of smoothing of, of uh, subgradient descent, so I won't describe all of them, but at the end, to convert the global optimum, okay, which is uh, around uh, here in terms of certificates, here you're globally optimal if you reach uh, that number, okay? And you need like at least 200 iterations, okay? So here, if you start to consider the smooth problems, okay, so it's a harder problem, but with uh, techniques which are uh, sometimes converged linearly, then uh, you go much quicker because simply you go from 1,000 here to 100, okay? So the number of iterations, this is purely empirical, of course, uh, go from 200 to uh, 20, okay? So in the paper, we show like several other instances, and typically the order is, uh, is, uh, is similar. You gain one order of magnitude, and here I've compared several approaches, okay? So this is uh, in blue gradient. It's Douglas Rashford is my alternating reflections. BCD is block coordinate descent, alternate projections, and so on. Because they all fare similar, similarly, but reflections is uh, much stable. So here, this is maybe uh, the, uh, the number which you really care about. It, if you compare with uh, Boikov's code, okay? So we took Boikov's code, and uh, for the moment, it is five to 10 times slower. Okay, so what we have done is simply implement what I described, which is a sequence of uh, message passing on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on chains, okay? So this is 20 lines of code. And with 20 lines of code, we are in the same ballpark as, 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 uh, as Boikov, but with uh, the key feature, first it's easy to code, so this is just for me, otherwise I couldn't code it. And it is parallelizable, okay, trivially. So here, they have two ways of making this parallel. Either, so if you look at this, in the formulations, uh, so here, let's look at this. You have two ways of make it, making things parallel either by accessing all the FJ uh, separately, okay, this is the first way, the classical way of using decomposition to make things parallel, but here we use the fact that for every, every FI, so for graph cuts, you can decompose it as a sequence of chains which are, uh, which are uh, independent, okay, in terms of graphical models, you can do all of them uh, in parallel, okay, so essentially, if you have a multi-core platform, you can parallelize it in a, in a very, very trivial way, and this is what we have done, okay, Pop, 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 pop. We have done, okay, and this is what we obtain with, uh, when you augment the number of cores. So here, of course, there is some loss, okay, because you have to need to handle like uh, adding and subtracting images, but we're able to get uh, some, uh, some speed up by adding the number of cores. Okay, so we're currently trying to uh, speed up, uh, crank up the uh, implementations to get uh, more, more, more cores. So first, our last, uh, last slide is why do you need uh, low duality gaps? Okay, so here, uh, as this is an example with high-order high potentials, okay? And I've compared several results uh, depending uh, of the gap that, that, that we can certify, okay? So this is, we start from 10 to the 4, okay? So if you, uh, uh, end, if you stop uh, so too soon, okay, then you can get some artifacts, okay? So if you go from 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 2, then you still have some artifacts, and you need to, to reach a bit further to get a, a good result, okay? So just an instant that, in the context of computer vision, for graph cuts, and as this, as this was also like um, notice for total variation denoising, really low precisions are important. Okay, it's just an instance uh, on that. Okay, so to conclude, I think the main message of the talk is that you can consider uh, some other functions as a generalization of graph cuts, but uh, you can use their structure to get uh, efficient ways of doing uh, some other function minimization. And here, only, we were only able to do this if you use a bit of the structure of the problem. Here, decomposability. So here I presented uh, 2D, because it's easy, but of course, uh, you can do 3D as well, by a sequence of chains, if you want. Video as well, okay? The key here is that since the algorithm is so simple, you can really adapt to the uh, problems which you have with your data. Is it too big or is it a stream? So it's really easy to adapt uh, with a few lines. The ongoing work, 
So here, for the moment, we have just like uh, four, uh, four examples. But here, the goal is uh, essentially uh, to package it, to make it uh, usable by the vision community. OK, and this is an ongoing, ongoing work. Higher order potentials. So we have done some experiments. It is clearly a way where you can go beyond graph cuts in a, in a simple way. And also, multiple partitions. So here, all our analysis relies on the fact that for binary segmentation, you have the exact equivalence between the continuous problem and the total variation denoising. It's not true anymore for multi-way partitions. This is clearly a subject of uh, importance for computer vision. Thank you. You have outlined in the first part, you have outlined this very general uh, framework, mm -hmm. but then for the illustration for the vision experiment, mm -hmm. you have done this decomposition and it was binary variables, right, for the segmentation? Binary, so, it was in binary variables. Uh, the segmentation probably foreground, background. It was binary variables, yeah. yeah. <coughs> the, goal was, the goal was to do, uh, is to estimate a set, okay? Right. So we want to estimate foreground, foreground against background, yes. So if you get a sub problems, you get basically now a quadratic sub problem instead of a linear function, right? Yeah. So, it seems very similar to the applications of ADMM to the discrete graphical models. For example, the work of Andre Martins, he has done it in the dual, or of Armie Globerson, where they applied ADMM in the primal LP relaxation. Sure, but here, okay, so here you, you can use ADMM. Okay, so key, uh, good question. So nothing prevents you from using ADMM directly on this, on the, okay? But if you do this, then you have first hyperparameters, okay, which is the, the, the step size, plus you solve a problem where the confidence rate, which is observed, is more of the order of 1 over t, whereas if you make it like strongly convex, essentially, then you get, uh, in practice, lin linear convergence rate. It is the exact same technique that, that would be like if you take any ADMM paper, oh, I have a sum of functions, let's use it, okay? I think, in fact, uh, Andras Krause has done it with his student, uh, Stober, but it doesn't work. Why? Because the problem is so hard that uh, it takes forever. But here, the key is that using simple techniques, but on the reformulation of the problem. Okay? So there's no, there is no, conceptually, this is the fact that you can use decomposability has been done before, and we're simply reusing it, but on a, in a problem which is now strongly convex, so much, much easier to solve. But for the other problems, so here, this trick of going from LP to QP works because of subundularity. So if you take like any uh, graphical model, okay, and you, which is with uh, non-attractive potentials, you can still define the quadratic problem of, of, of the same form. But I'm not sure it's going to. Uh, this is a good question. I don't know. Okay, where can you push this equivalence between like the continuous problem of the LP and the uh, QP? But uh, is, there, is there any relation between um, these reflection methods and something like over relaxation, which also seems to sort of. It's mm -hmm. all, I have to admit, like uh, six months ago, I would have to answer like, like this, because they're all related, but in all, like, uh, we have to reformulate the problems many times, and I forgot. Yeah. But they are, it is related. I, th I think it, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's. And the goal is, in fact, we are currently rewriting the paper to make the links explicit. Because uh, all those problems, in particular, finding the distance between two polytops can be approached in many, many different reformulations. Okay, I mean, it's, 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 you have five which are natural, and if you apply ADMM to any of those, you get a different result. Okay? And uh, at least like, I tend to believe, like Bosch, Cohen, Combet, and uh, they tried many of those, and this, at least they advocate it's the correct, the best way. Okay? But I have no other like, uh, insights. Just to follow up, um, total follow up in an unrelated way. Did, uh, uh, do you have any comments about submodular maximization? Is that sort of so? Here, uh, except that my paper got rejected at NIPS. Uh, no, <laughs> I'm joking. And uh, no, no, no. <laughs> no, it was not a joke meant to you. But okay, anyway. Uh, no, I think it's really important because, in fact, if you look at my book of examples, okay, uh, if you look at my book of examples from the uh, first part of the talk, many problems are naturally cast as subnular maximization. Experimental design is cast. 
And for those problems, the type of techniques using some modularity is totally different. It's using like classical, like uh, computer science, where you, you take like simple algorithms and analyze them precisely, okay? And they're still missing uh, uh, a bridge between what people use in minimization, which is convexity most, mostly, and in maximization, which is non-convexity. Uh, what we have now uh, with a student is one approach to use graphical model concepts to do some other function maximization. Okay, essentially, you want to estimate your uh, some other functions through cuts, uh, through like uh, through graphical models like trees and uh, maybe higher tree widths. Okay, so now we have a rational formulation for maximization, but uh, it's still a bit non-efficient in the sense that uh, you have to estimate like a low tree width graph, which is not easy, and so on. But it's clearly it's clearly a problem of importance, which was attacked with mostly tools from uh, theoretical computer science, and I believe that machine learning tools, like graphical models, like especially the, the book, the, the tutorial of like Wainwright and Jordan, can simply, simply be applied to maximization, which is what we have tried to do with the student. I have one question related to mm -hmm. Zubin's first question. Mm -hmm. um, so using the analogy with successive over relaxation, mm -hmm. you can think of these reflections as you jump to the projection point and then you jump one more unit on. Mm -hmm. It's like you've mm -hmm. taken a double-sized step. Yeah. Um, and then you'll find lots of people who say, oh, you should do one and a half, or you should have a schedule of one over T or one over root T of what this, you know, do you think those sorts of schedules might apply here? Sure, sure. You take the classical ADMM, you have the sum of gamma K, two minus gamma K has to, be, has to go to infinity. Okay, so the middle is gamma K equals one, okay? But any, any applies, and I have to, in fact, you see something I often tell, like uh, combat, it's okay to have all possible conditions for which it does converge, but give me the best, so give me an intuition why one is better than the other. And I think it's not clear that, okay, I don't know how to do this. And uh, the goal really for those problems to be, to be parameter free. Okay, it's really to me a key, a key, a key insight and block coordinate descent, why is it so nice? It's parameter free. But it's not nice. I know you don't like it, but, uh, <laughs> but in that context, uh, well, in that context, okay, so if you want really to. Uh, I mean, for me, setting a parameter to one is no different from Setting it to one and hiding it is not the same as being parameter free. <laughs> no, 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 but no, no, no. if you take like block, just. Okay, so doing block on the descent on two vector spaces, I agree, not useful. But if you do block on the descent where your functions are some weird, some weird behaviors, because you have, have non-smoothness in some parameters, non-smoothness on the others, then you cannot do like a joint optimization. Okay, so here we are in that format, but I cannot get it back. We are in that format here where uh, the space where those are, are, are living is not a vector space. So we cannot use Newton. Let's, let's say you want to use like damp Newton, okay, which is the best method in the world. Uh, you cannot, here you cannot do it because you have the uh, additional structure and uh, non-smoothness. But clearly, um, in many cases, uh, it's better to go direct than try to go uh, block on a descent, except for the lack of parameters. Like EM, EM has no parameters. Maybe slow, but at least you have no parameters. Oh, sorry, one more. Just mm -hmm. you have this divergent subsequence or the outer divergent sequence. Yeah. Is there any uh, numerical care you need to take with that part of the iteration? Um, that's a good point. I have to admit I don't know. Uh, and typically, uh, people that design those algorithms uh, don't care. That's a good point. In fact, my goal for this like, semester is really to try to get this paper and understand and try to derive a proper analysis, uh, like confidence rights and so on, because it's really mysterious to me. Okay. If we have no more questions, thank you very much. Thank you.